Father, we thank you so much for such an opportunity you have given us. We thank you so much for your word, that the entrance of your word gives light, it gives understanding, O oh God. I thank you because of the things that are going to be shared today. Our lives indeed can never remain the same. Father, I give you praise, I give you glory, because of your presence is mighty uh, in our lives. I thank you because we see tremendous multiplication in our finances as a result of what is going to be shared, oh God. I give you praise, I give you glory. In Jesus' name, we pray and everybody say, Amen. So once again, I would like to thank you so much for each and every one of you for taking off time to be a part of this. I see uh, so many responses are coming in. Um, so we thank God so much for the fellowship. You know, the fellowship of the saints is extremely important um, because the Bible tells, tells us not to give up the habit of meeting together, you know. And um, so every time we are together, whether it's online, whether it's physical, we don't take that for granted. Yeah. So we thank God so much for each and every one of you. I'm seeing some over 100 people have, have tuned in, so we thank God so much for that. Um, so just allow me to go right into the message for today. Um, I'm going to take my, 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 my sharing. My sharing really is going to be based on... Um, on things that our man of God, Apostle Grace, has preached, but um, maybe to throw more light on certain areas, maybe to um, dwell on certain points, you know, because time sometimes doesn't allow him to share so many things. So, so maybe just to dwell on certain points, um, as, as 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 was revealed to me as I listened to him. Um, of course, it's important that um, for such a someone like this one, uh, we would need to get um, the Fanero Global School of Ministry death free someone where Apostle talked about our common wealth. Um, I'm, going to, I'm going to really base so much on what he shared in there uh, to, to build something. Yeah. So. Um, I want to start this way. Um, the Bible tells us in First Timothy chapter six, verse ten. First Timothy chapter six, verse ten. <laughs> this is an interesting way of starting, but um, I wanted to start this way. First Timothy chapter six, verse ten. If you have your Bibles with you, uh, the Bible says, "For the love of money is the root of all evil." which while some converted after they have erred from the faith okay so he says that there are people who have erred from the faith it's possible for a man to err from the faith because of the love of money and the Bible says that they have pierced themselves through with many sorrows. I'm reading from the King James Version. Okay? They have pierced themselves through with many sorrows. So you find people of this world pierced through with many sorrows. Why? Because of the love of money. And you know, this scripture is, you know, truth is, 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 is absolute. Okay? I want you to notice what he says at the beginning. He says, for the love of money. He didn't say money, okay? It's not money, but the love of money, the Bible says, is the root of all evil. He didn't say some evil. He didn't say most evil. He says, all evil can be traced back to the love of money. And that is so big. That is so powerful. If you can take time to meditate through, you'll be amazed at, at, at the things that you will discover, you know, that all evil, whatever, when you say evil, we are talking about the, 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 the Greek word used there is speaks of the essential character of evil as expressed 
in, in, in your mode of thinking, in your feeling, and in your acting. So that character, that nature of evil that is expressed in somebody's mode of thinking, in somebody's mode of feeling, in somebody's mode of acting, that all evil in all its forms, the Bible says it can be traced back to the love of money. The love of money. So, in as much as we're going to talk about finances, about wealth, we need to understand this very scripture, that the love of money is the root of all evil. All. Not some evil, not most evil, but all evil can be traced back to the love of money. Now, you ask yourself, why is it that way? Why, why can we trace back? Why can we trace all evil? Any form of evil you have seen or experienced can be traced back to the love of money. So you ask yourself, why? Why is that so? Because in the Bible, love is I mean, money is compared to a god. Okay. When you look at, um, at Luke chapter 16, verse 10, we're going to start from verse 10 to 13, okay? And I'll also uh, get the same portion, but from Matthew chapter 6, verse 21 to 24. So we shall look at those two scriptures, those two portions of scriptures. Now in Luke 16, Luke 16, verse 10 to 13. Now, of course, the verses before speak about um, um, a, a certain manager who has found who, whose dealings, you know, the the, the king had uh, had been told that that he was dealing unjustly with his resources, okay, and so he wanted to fire him. Actually, he fired him, and so the Bible says that this manager began to think to himself, saying, "You know what? I've been fired. I cannot dig. I cannot beg," and so he, he formed up a strategy and said, "You know what? I want to." I want to look at, I want to find a way of, of surviving. So he went to all, he called all the debtors, all who owed uh, his master money. He called them and he asked each one of them, he said, so he asked the first one, how much did you owe my master? And I think he said, uh, I think a uh, hundred measures of oil. And then he told him, you know what, you cross the bill and write 50. And then he called another person. And I asked him, how much do you, how much do you owe my master? And then he asked, he told him, 100 measures of meat. And then he told him, he crossed it and write, I think he said either 70 or 80, I'm not sure. And, and so, and then the Bible says that, that, that he was commended. He was commended for being wise. Let me just get a portion that I can. Um, yes, and the Lord, so, in verse 8 says, and the Lord, that is the master of that, of, of that manager, commended the unjust steward because he had done wisely. Okay? For the children of this world, the Bible says, are in their generation wiser than the children of light. And I say unto you, make to yourselves friends of the mammon of unrighteousness, that when you fail, okay, that when you fail, okay, for us, we don't plan to fail. Hallelujah. But if you're planning to fail, if you fail, they may receive you into everlasting habitation. So you're still in, uh, the wisdom on this man was twofold. Um, he made friends through money with the, with the king's debtors by reducing their, their debt. But also, indirectly, he made, the, he made, he made his master look good to them. So it was a win-win situation, okay? That his master looked good because it looked like he had reduced on their debt, but at the same time he looked also good because he's the one who actually reduced their debt. I hope you can get my, my point here. Yeah? So, so in a way he looked, he, he looked so generous, looked so good. So he made friends through money, and so Jesus says that um, he says that. Um, um, make for yourselves friends, okay, of the mammon of unrighteousness, that when you fail, if you're planning to fail, 
because once you don't plan to fail. But if you fail, these guys will help you. That, that's to say wisdom alone, okay? That you can make friends through money. That when you fail, they'll help you. But of course, we do not plan to fail because love never fails. Hallelujah. Um, then he says in verse 10, He that is faithful, in that which is least is faithful, also in much. And he that is unjust, in the least is unjust, also in much. It's a truth infallible. That when a man is faithful in the least, they are faithful also in much. They don't need to have much to, dis to demonstrate their faithfulness. The fact that they are faithful in the list is already proof that they are faithful in much. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Yep. Now, I need to get the mind of Jesus here. In verse 11 it says, If therefore you have, you have not been faithful in unrighteous mammon, that means who will commit to you, who will commit to your trust the true riches? That means to God, unrighteous mammon is the least. Hope you understand that. In verse 10 you are saying, he that is faithful in that which is least is faithful also in much. And he that is unjust in the least is unjust also in much. Then he says, if therefore, that means based on this, if therefore you have not been faithful in unrighteous mammon, Okay, so if you follow, if you follow the narrative here, he's saying that unrighteous mammon or money is the least, the least area. And it is all commit to your trust the true riches. So there is such a thing as the true riches. So that means riches. When you talk about a man being rich, it's more than just having money. Okay, money is part of it. Physical possessions are part of it, but being rich, true riches are beyond money. Okay, that's what we see here. Okay. Then he says in verse twelve, and if you have not, if you have not been faithful in that which is another man's, who will give you that which is your own? So this is the principle we live by, even at our workplaces in the ministry, that. As we demonstrate faithfulness, okay, in a ministry we are serving in, we are positioning ourselves to be entrusted with our own. As we demonstrate faithfulness in a at your workplace, you're positioning yourself to be trusted with your own. It's, it's a principle that you can live by in anything. But as long as you're faithful in that which is another man's, okay, the Bible says you will be given your own. And your own, when you look at the verse before, is actually what we call the true riches. The true riches are what are yours. Hallelujah. Then now the next verse says, verse 13, no servant can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will hold to the one and despise the other. Then he says, you cannot serve God and Mammon. So to go, according to the scriptures, Mammon is in a class of God. Not God capital G, but it can be a master of somebody. Okay? That's why he says that in relating, in relating with with anything that is God like, in relating to them. In verse 13 it says you can either love one and hate the other, or you can hold on to one and despise the other. So this is where the love of money comes from. That means um, the one who has the love of money, money is their God. So to them they have loved money and hated God. Are you seeing that? They have held on to money and they have despised God. Because Jesus said, you cannot serve two masters. It's not possible. Hallelujah. So, it's from this scripture that Paul gets the mind that the love of money is the root of all evil. Hallelujah. So, because in this instance, for me to love money means that I have inevitably made money my master. 
and that means I have despised God. By default, the fact that I have loved money, I have despised. It's a default. You can, you cannot you cannot love God and money at the same time. Hallelujah. That means for us who are born again, if we are to hold on to God, that means we despise money. That should be our mindset. If we are to love God, we will hate money. <laughs> it's amazing. But hating money does not mean that Hope you understand the the, the, the language here. Yeah, hating money is, is is putting it in its place. You see that you put it in its place as a servant because I think it's in Ecclesiastes chapter ten where it says that money answers to all. Money answers. That means somebody else is calling the shots. Somebody else is making the demands, and money is answering. Now, who is that who's making the demands? You and I. So money was not designed to be a master. It was designed to be a servant. It's important for us to have that, that understanding. Okay. So when you're dealing with money, you despise. It's, it's despised. It, it's not something. It has, it has, of course, to despise doesn't mean that, that it means to think less, but it does not mean that it doesn't have value. But the fact that, the fact that all evil can be traced back to the love of money, it shows you that money is spiritual. Okay? So, yes, we understand the place of money. Yes, we know what money can do. Okay? Actually, when you study the scriptures, like in, in Daniel, um, when um, the angel appeared to Daniel and told him that your prayers have been were hard from the first day you prayed, from the first day from, from the first day started praying, but but I was held back by the prince of Persia for 21 days, okay, and then he says that, uh, he, uh, and so he comes to speak to Daniel, and then he tells him that after I've spoken to you, I'm going back to the battle. And after we have dealt with the Prince of Persia, then the Prince of Greece is going to come. Now, in the physical world, there was a King of Persia, there was a King of Greece. But in the spiritual world, there was a Prince of Persia, and there was a Prince of Greece. And the angels were dealing with these principalities. Now, in the next, that is Daniel 10. Now, in Daniel 11, okay, if you take time to read through, in Daniel 11, when the angel was speaking to, to Daniel, he told him that actually there won't arise, I think he said, four kings in Persia, but the fourth one will be, will be rich, very rich. And the Bible says, by reason of strength, through his riches, he will star against the prince of Greece. That means a man by wealth, okay, wealth gave a man strength to deal with a certain principality called Greece. Hallelujah. So money is that big, you know, that people who can who control, you, you can see it in this world, like people, people who control the narrative of who have money. Yeah, by reason, because money gives a man a certain strength, spiritually. So this king of Persia, by reason of strength through his riches, was going to start up a war against Greece. That is physical. But actually in the spirit, they were going to overthrow Greece. Okay? The principality of Greece was going to be dealt with by the principality of Persia. You see that? But physically, a man by wealth. So this spiritual act was represented physically through a man having a lot of money. <laughs> so you need to understand that money is that, you know, there are spirits behind money, okay? The spirit of God 
or evil spirits. And we saw that money is compared to a god. You cannot serve God or mammon. Okay, so it's important for us to understand that dynamic. Yeah. So, um, in having that background, um, the Bible tells us in Proverbs chapter twenty-three, verse four, it says, "Labor not to be rich." Okay, seize from thy own wisdom. Now, why does the Bible says? Why does the Bible tell us, "Labor not to be rich"? The word is there for labor is speaking of a worrisome toil. Somebody is striving to be rich. But then he explains to us, they seize from your from their own wisdom. That means this person is laboring with his own wisdom. That's where the problem is. Okay? It doesn't mean that we're not supposed to labor. Because yeah. other scriptures that say that by reason of labor you can increase your wealth. Okay? Those are principles which we'll talk about them later. Okay, but now here he's telling us labor not to be rich. Now, okay, before we go into this, before we go into uh, Proverbs, um, let me just make a point in um, in um, what we read in Luke chapter 16. Yeah? Luke chapter 16, we, we, we saw that uh, if, 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 you, if, if you, if, and if you have not been faithful in that which is another man, uh, who shall adjust you in your own? We realize that, that um, one of the very key principles required of us when we're dealing with money is faithfulness. Okay? Faithfulness. That's number one. We see that. Then number two, we see that the other principle that we see from that scripture is, is, is we make a choice to serve God. Okay? That to us, God is our God. Jesus Christ is our Lord. And money is a servant. Yeah, that means you live a life where money does not dictate what you do, but God does. That is a man who is submit. You see, you see, when you accepted Jesus as Lord, I think sometimes you don't understand what that means. When you accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, it means two things. Okay, it, it meant two things. Number one, it meant that you are now under the ownership of Jesus. Jesus owns your life. Okay, and, and, and this, this Christian walk, what we call the Christian walk, is us growing to understand what that means. What does it mean for Jesus to own your life? Okay, that's one part of it. One part of it is that you are, he owns your life, you are submitted to him. You know, when the Bible is talking about the relationship between church, between the church and Christ, it speaks of the relationship of the body and the head, okay? And the body, all that the body does is, the body just does the beating of the head. We are submitted to the head, okay? We are called to submit. That's what it means, that's the first thing it means. And that's what we all know. We all know that aspect of, 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 of accepting Jesus Christ as Lord. We, we all know that it means I've now come under the, the ownership of Jesus. Jesus owns my life. Jesus is my master. Uh, I'm, I'm going to do things differently. Okay. We understand that aspect. But there's another aspect to it that many people haven't yet fully understood. When you say Jesus has, is my Lord, it also means that you are, your nature has been changed from the earthy to the Lord from heaven. That means you have taken on the nature of lordship. Okay, that means that Jesus being your Lord, not only does it put you under him, but it puts everything else under you. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. It puts everything else under you. So the fact that Jesus is my Lord, he, 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 it's, not, it's not just a substitute, a place where I'm a servant only. Yes, I'm a servant to him. I am Lord to everything else. <laughs> Hallelujah. I'm Lord to everything else. That's what it means. Okay? And it's important for us to understand that. Because in that someone, when the apostle was talking about um, 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 our global school of ministry, the three, he spoke about the relationship between wealth and value. What is your value? It's important for you to know your value. 
our primary value is Jesus Christ, who we are in Christ. Okay? We are Lord. Money looks at us as Lord. It's us who sometimes don't know it. And so we, we, we find ourselves changing the order and making it Lord. No. No, sir. Money is your servant. Everything else in this world responds to you as Lord because you've taken on the nature of Lordship. Okay? So money does not dictate your life. Money does not, you, you can't say I can't go here because I don't have money. No, that's not, the, that's, you should, you know, it's, 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 that mindset has to be rubbed from your mind. You, you know, that's, that's why in the Bible says be renewed, be renewed in your mind. You know, the things that people say they can't do because of money. Who say? If you feel it in your heart to do it, and, and you have been instructed by Jesus to do it, come on. No, nothing can hold you back, not even money. That should be your mindset because you hail from God. You, 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 he is Lord of your life. Hallelujah. He is Lord of your life. He is Lord of your life. He owns your life. But, you, but it also means you are Lord over everything else. Praise God. Hallelujah. Okay. Those are the two things that we get from the scripture. Number one, we, we, a certain faithfulness is required from us Okay, in Luke chapter 16. And then number two, that God is our master. Okay, he, Jesus is our Lord, and so that means um, we are yielded to Him. So the faithfulness here is now the faithfulness to what He says. Okay, and then number two, we are Lord over money. Hallelujah. So we need to mark those two points. Okay, that, that's what we pick. That's what I I think is necessary for us in this discussion from Luke chapter 16: faithfulness and us understanding that we are Lord over money. Now, uh, so let, let us now go to Proverbs 7, 33, verse 4. It says, labor not to be rich, seize from thy own wisdom. So that means the issue here is the labor is based on your own wisdom. You know, the scriptures give a clear distinction between the wisdom of God, the wisdom of this world, and the wisdom of man. Okay, that's it's, that's another another subject altogether. Okay, he says labor not to be rich. So this labor, this wearisome toil. Remember what read in, in First Timothy uh, chapter six, verse ten. Those who are lovers of money, they, they pierce. The Bible says they pierce themselves through with many sorrows. Okay, that's the same idea here. That the labor not to be that poor. The, the labor is wearisome. It's from a place of toil to be rich. Says so don't do that. This is the wisdom of God speaking to us by the way. It says never not to be rich. And it's a reason for that. Okay? Now, Proverbs still, Proverbs still verse, uh, chapter 28, verse 20. Proverbs 28, verses 20. The Bible says, A faithful man shall abound with blessings. Again, we see the aspect of faithfulness. A faithful man shall abound with blessings. But he that maketh haste to be rich shall not be innocent. He that maketh haste to be rich. That's the same, it's the same idea. Labor not to be rich. Speaking of a man who's making haste to be rich. Haste. He's hasty. Okay? Proverbs 28, verses 22. So, we read Proverbs 28, verses 20. Now, let's look at verse 22. Now, 22 gives us a full picture. He says, he that hastens to be rich has an evil eye. That's where the problem is. The problem is the man who is hasting to be rich, his problem is that this, his eye is evil. And consider if not the poverty that come upon him. He that hastens, he, whether he's born again, whether he's not born again, this one applies everywhere. He, he born again, he not born again, he male, he female, that hastens to be rich, has an evil eye. The word is for hasten, it's, it's, it's from a place of anxiety, a place of sorrow. That means there's a love of money somewhere. Okay? And he says his problem is that he has an evil eye. He has an evil eye. And this person doesn't consider that poverty shall come upon him. That means, yes, 
in experience, in truth. You need to understand in truth. The Bible says that um, we know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he were rich, yet for your sakes he became poor, that you through his poverty may become rich. That's, I think, Second Corinthians chapter 8, that we through his poverty have been made rich. So in truth we are rich. Hallelujah. That's why we don't labor to be rich, because we are already rich. But in experience, somebody can, in his physical experience, poverty can be in somebody, a Christian's life. Why? Because they are hastening to be rich. They don't know who they are. That's what the problem is. Yeah? And, and why don't they know who they are? It's because they, are, they have an evil eye. Their eye is evil. And now that brings me back to Matthew. Remember, I had spoken about Luke 16. I'll go to Matthew chapter 6, verse 21, okay? Here yeah, I'm just laying a bit of foundation, okay? Matthew 6, verse 21 says, For where your treasure is, there will, there will your heart be also. The light of the body is the eye. The light of the body is the eye. If therefore thine eye be single, okay, thy whole body shall be full of light. But if thine eye be evil, what happens? Thy whole body shall be full of darkness. You see that? So because of the evil eye, that man is walking in darkness. And the darkness is, is, is expressed in his haste to be rich. Because he doesn't know that he's rich. And because there's darkness, he doesn't see his poverty coming. He doesn't see that poverty is actually going to envelop him. I see the connection here. Yeah. And so when you continue reading in Matthew chapter 6, okay, it says, but if then I be evil, thy whole body, uh, here I'm reading 6, 21, uh, 22, 23, okay? But if thine eye be evil, thy whole body shall be full of darkness. If therefore the light that is in thee be darkness, how great is that darkness? If what you consider as light, to God it is darkness. Oh! It says how great is that darkness. You are so, so lost. And then in verse 24, again he says, no man shall serve two masters. Are you saying that? So the evil eye, the single eye is connected to the issue of money and God. Because it says, no man shall, no man can serve two masters for either he will hate the one and love the other. That is a response. You either hate money and love God, or you hate God and love money, or else you hold on to God and despise money, or hold on to money and despise God. He says, we cannot serve God and love him. But you, you, you're seeing the progression here, that it's from a place of eye, your eye, your vision. How do you see these things? So that's why he says, labor not to be rich, because that person, already his vision is wrong. He doesn't see that he's already rich if he's born again. Hallelujah. Say amen. Okay? So the vision, what is your vision? What is, how is your perception on this thing called wealth? What is your perception on this thing called riches? That's very important. Hallelujah. So, in that someone again, I, I want to, of Apostle Grace, I want to base, no, I was just laying foundation actually. So I want to base my teaching on two, on two, because he gave about eight principles, but he, he mentioned two, which I think I want to base my teaching on. He said something about value, which I've spoken about, and then he spoke about uh, your attitude towards money. Okay, that's what I was going to touch that, the attitude. What is your perception? What is the right perception? How are we to see this issue of finances. I've already told us that we are masters. We ne you never forget that we are masters of our money. You need to exercise your faith every other day. I know sometimes, you know, that's what the Bible says, fight the good fight of faith. It says fight the good fight of faith. It's a fight of faith, okay? I know sometimes your account can look empty and there are things that you would want to do, but you need to maintain, you need to maintain that consciousness that I can do those things, irrespective of what I see on my, irrespective of, 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 
of the emptiness of my bank account, irrespective of, of, of my financial, physical financial status. Nothing can stop me from doing this thing. You, you need to train your consciousness. Train, no, that, that's you now fighting a good fight of faith. You see that? You, you need to maintain that consciousness every other day. Build it, build it, exercise. Those so days, so that's why we exercise ourselves in godliness. That's now you exercising yourself, your spiritual muscles, okay? It happens to, it happens to people, okay? If you find that there's this dream in your heart, but your, your financial status does not seem to, eh, to agree with it. So I, are you going to start to get worried in your heart? Are you going to give in to the worry? Are you going to give in to, uh, are you going to give up on it? That is you serving money. Because actually, when, when you read Matthew chapter 6, the next verse 625 says, Therefore, take no thought about your life. <laughs> so when he talks about the place of taking no thought about your life, what you eat, what you drink, he's still dealing with the issue of mammon. Okay? So, you, you need to maintain you need to build your consciousness, maintain, uh, fight the good fight of faith and, and, and refuse any thoughts that tells you that you can't do something because you don't have the finances for it. Refuse it. As long as that thing that you want to do is of God, as long as you, it, it's an instruction from God, as long as it's something that you feel to do is, is from God, always maintain the mind that I can do all things through Christ to strengthen. That is us rising above money. That's us rising above the influence and and, and, and and the dominion of money because we are masters, okay? Remember, like I told you, uh, when you look at First Corinthians chapter, chapter 15, uh, the Bible says that after, after Jesus uh, died for us and was raised from the dead, the Bible says now seated at the right hand of the Father, kill all his enemies are put under his feet. Kill all his enemies. Actually, I can get the scripture for you. Okay. I, I, I'm, I'm trying to build some. I feel somebody needs this. Okay. Uh, kill all his enemies are put under his foot. Let me get it for you. Footstool. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Okay. Um, yes. In Hebrews. In Hebrews chapter 1, okay, it, it's Hebrews chapter 10, Hebrews chapter 10 verse 12, it says, But this man, speaking of Jesus, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins forever, sat down on the right hand of God, from henceforth expecting till his enemies be made his footstool. So he's seated at the right hand expecting his enemies to be made his footstool. So right now, we, we are seated with him in, in, in heavenly places, far above all principality and power. Kill his enemies and made his what? His footstool. And the Bible says, I think, I think in another version, it says that the last enemy to be defeated is death. Yes, these things were defeated. Christ defeated them. But in experience, in experience, for, because when you say Christ is seated, remember, we are his body. We are his body. So in the experience, experience of his body because remember he's the head and we are the body so yes him as jesus christ he defeated all these things and it is true it is true for every child of god but in the experience of it you find that there are things that seem to have dominion of a christian okay that's why I say you're seated. You need to maintain that place where you're seated. It's a consciousness. You maintain that place that these things were defeated. Okay, I have dominion over finances. I have dominion over money. Nothing can stop me from doing what God has blessed in my heart. Not, not finances. No, I'm above finances. I'm above it. You maintain that faith. Kill his enemies, you put under his feet. Kill. Okay, so. Truth versus the experience, the physical experience of the Christian. 
That's the side of faith. Truth was an experience. Okay? It is true. By stripes, you were healed. You were healed. But in experience, physically, you've been diagnosed with maybe cancer or whatever it is. So the fight of faith there is to hold on to the truth and despise the physical experience. Okay? That's the same thing, even in finances. Truth by it, he says, we know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. Although he was rich for your sakes, he became poor. That like you through his poverty may become rich, rich like he was. He owns the whole, and that is true. It is truth. It is true. Nothing can change that truth. All things are yours. Then I've experienced to some that doesn't look that way. So truth versus experience. The fire of faith. You refuse what you see. And you say, God, say this and I'm this. You maintain that mind. You maintain that consciousness. And interestingly, as you maintain that mind, as you maintain that consciousness, the Spirit of God will always navigate you to whatever you need to know. Because the Bible calls him the Spirit of truth. And he bears witness to truth. He does not bear witness with a lie. And what is truth, what Jesus did. So as, as, as you maintain that consciousness that I'm this because of what God said I am, you're positioning yourself to easily receive instruction from you. And before you know it, you know, you know what to do. You know what to do. It's okay. This, you know, the, the wisdom of investment, all these other things that come along will start to work in your life. Why? Because you, 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 you remain true. You, you speak to the truth. He said that I am rich through his poverty. Hallelujah. He says that I am Lord of heaven. I'm, 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 I'm of the heavenly nature. And the heavenly nature is Lord of all. You, you, you maintain that consciousness. You stick to that faith. You stick to that understanding. You maintain that faith. And as you do that, remember, this, this, this is not baseless faith. No, 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 no. Our faith is based on the word of God. I, I'm not just telling you to have positive confession. This is the difference between uh, the Christian and the New Age. You know, New Age speaks of positive, you know, think positive, uh, dream positive, and, and all that. And, uh, and there's a place for it. But no, this, our uh, positive, or what you would call positive speaking, is based on truth, infallible truth. By the word of God, the confidence, our source of confidence. That's why I say that that your faith may not may not stand in the words of men, but in the power of God. The reason why I maintain this mind that I'm rich is because of what He said in His Word about me. So I maintain that, irrespective of my current experience physically. And as I do that, the Spirit of Truth bears witness in my spirit. And the following instructions has to come through. Instructions has to come through. Instructions has to come through. And you'll know what to do. You'll know what to do. Hallelujah. And you see, the, the reason why it's important for us to know who we are in Christ is because when, it, when the manifestation, the physical manifestation comes through, we will not be changed. Hallelujah. Because remember the Bible says Jesus gave an important wisdom. I think it's in Luke. Uh, it's in Luke. Uh, it's in Luke. Uh. Hello? Um, it's in Luke, somewhere in Luke 16, where it says that a man's life does not consist in the abundance of his possessions. Very important wisdom, okay? Your life is not in the abundance of things that you hold. Your life your life is in who you are in God. You see that? Our man of God always says that there are people, that, you know, he always makes a statement that, that God is helping some people by not making, giving them certain money because when they have it, <laughs> their lives will change. The reason why their lives will change is because they don't know who they are in the first place. They, 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 they think that they're going to be defined by those things. No, you need to know who you are first in God. That when it later on manifests, 
it doesn't change you you remain your because you know who you are you know you're a humble man you know you're a faithful man you know you know the scriptures have defined who you are and and and, and, and so the million dollars that a hundred million dollars comes in you, you're not changed you're not moved <laughs> you're not moved why because you already played that a long time ago <laughs> you already saw yourself there a long time ago and beyond actually even that is not what you are anyway. <laughs> it's far less than who you are. Say amen. Yeah. So it's important for us to build our understanding of who we are. Hallelujah. We need to value who are you. Our primary value is who we are in Christ. That's our primary value. We are masters over these things. Say amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Now, I want to share this uh, on, on the issue of faithfulness, okay? Faithfulness. Remember, he speaks of faithfulness. He says, when you're faithful in an unrighteous moment, you'll, you'll be entrusted with your with true riches. So this area of faithfulness, okay? Um, I'm going to just touch a few things, okay? Uh, the wisdom of God calls us to a certain faithfulness in finances, okay? Um, financial management, okay? Genesis chapter, Genesis chapter 41, verses 35, verses 34 to 36. Genesis 41, 34 to 36. Now, the background of this story is God gave two dreams to Pharaoh. <laughs> Pharaoh dreamt Two dreams about I think uh, I think seven cows eating eating uh, eating seven healthy cows and then about uh, yeah, I think years okay years of corn and so he 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 called people to give interpretation and nobody could interpret what he dreamt and so somebody remembered one of the people remembered that was a man called Joseph who had given an interpretation of his own dream when he was in prison. And so he calls him out. So that's the background we had. I think many of us know the story, I'm very sure. So in Genesis 41, verse 34, 36, this is Joseph speaking to the king. He has given the interpretation of a dream, and now he's giving further advice. Now in 34, he says, let, this is Joseph speaking, he says, let Pharaoh do this, and let him appoint officers over the land, and take up the fifth part of the land of Egypt in the seven plenteous years. I want us to mark that. Take up the fifth part of the land of Egypt in the seven plenteous years. Okay? And let them gather all the food of those good years that are coming and store up grain under the authority of Pharaoh and let them keep food in the cities. Okay? So there won't be seven plenteous years, seven years of of, of, of of, of tremendous, uh, you know, riches, you know, the, the land was going to be uh, fertile and everything. And then after the seven years, we're going to be seven years of famine. And so Pharaoh, I mean, Joseph speaking to Pharaoh, he told him that let us get a fifth part of the land of Egypt, okay, every year and store it up, store it up. And in every put keep keep food in every city, and then in verse thirty six says, then that food shall be as a reserve for the land for the land for the seven years of famine which shall be in the land of Egypt, that the land may not perish during that famine. So now it brings a principle called saving. That's one of the principles. Remember, we are we are called to be faithful. I've spoken about the lordship. Okay, knowing who we are, that is an aspect of being faithful. To the wisdom of God, the wisdom, we are dealing with the wisdom of God. Okay. So say you take up a fifth of the part, always store up a fifth. Okay. Yes, you can enjoy the land, but always put aside a fifth. Now, Joseph's mind was in verse 36, then that food shall be as a result for the land for the seven years of famine which shall be in the land of Egypt, that the land may not perish during the famine. 
So Joseph's mind was, when we store up a fifth, we'll have enough food during the seven years of famine, and Egypt will not perish. Okay, that was Joseph's Joseph mind. That's what he told the king. But little did he know how that wisdom didn't only serve Egypt, but served the whole world. Okay? When it dropped down, still Genesis 40, 41, verses 56 to 57, when it dropped down 56, this is when the famine had come through. The famine was over the face of the earth, and Joseph opened all the storehouses and sold to the Egyptians, and the famine became severe in the land of Egypt, so all countries, the Bible says, all countries came to Joseph in Egypt to buy grain because the famine was severe in all lands. This is amazing. Joseph thought that that wisdom was only going to save Egypt. But God had a bigger plan for that wisdom. All countries, the Bible says, all countries came to Joseph in Egypt to buy grain. This famine hit the whole world. And people are going to Joseph to buy grain. But what wisdom did he use? The wisdom of saving. Saving. Yeah? It is, this is something that also God has taught me. Me and my family decided to save. I've been saving. It's very important. And you see, here, Yes, yes, we sell, we sell, you no, know, we normally have that, that uh, adage, you know, I think it's a scripture, it says uh, we sell for the rainy day, okay? At times when things will be a bit hard, like now, for example, in this COVID period, uh, where many people have, are no longer working, people have been laid off their jobs, and if somebody had not saved before, how will they be surviving right now? But you see, the mind of God is bigger than just your personal survival. It's bigger than that. Just by saving alone, Joseph helped the whole world. The whole world. Okay. Now, I want, you to, I want us to get the full picture here. Let us go to Genesis, okay, 47. Genesis 47, verse 15. We're going to build this thing, okay? Genesis 47, verse 15. So don't look at your savings as, as you know, for personal, uh, for the rainy day personal. You know, get the mind of God here that actually through your savings you can save an entire nation because you saved money. And the least you can save is, you see, you said a fifth of the land. That means 20%. Just the list, because I also save more than that, but at least 20%, put it aside. Okay? This is faithfulness. Remember, we're dealing with faithfulness. Now, in Genesis 47, verse 15, the Bible says, when money failed in the land of Egypt, that means there was a point when money had failed. <laughs> that means people didn't have enough, the money, they had used all the money, and it was no, not there. And in the land of Canaan, and all Egyptians came to Auntie Joseph and said, Give us bread, for why should we die in thy presence? For the money failed. That means they had no more money. It was, it was gone. They had bought, 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 and now it, they didn't have any more money. Okay? Now look at verse 16. And Joseph said, Give your cattle, and I'll give you for your cattle if money fail. And they brought their cattle unto Joseph, and Joseph gave them bread in exchange for horses, and for, for the flocks, and for the cattle of the herds, and for the asses, and he fed them with bread for all their cattle for that year. That means there was an exchange. They brought in all their cattle. That means money had failed. So now they had, they just now brought in their cattle and said, you know, I just take our cattle and give us food. And so he fed them for that year. Now when that year ended, verse 18, they come unto him at the second year and said unto him, We will not hide it from, from my Lord how that our money is spent. Okay. Our money is spent. My Lord also has 
has our herds of cattle, that means even their herds of cattle have been taken. There is not aught left in the sight of my Lord but our bodies and our land. That means they had nothing left except their bodies and their land. <laughs> Wherefore shall we die before thine eyes, both we and our land? Buy us and our land for bread, and we and our land will be servants unto Pharaoh, and give us seed that we may live and not die, that the land be not desolate. And Joseph bought all the land of Egypt for Pharaoh. That means because of the wisdom of saving, <laughs> the man bought the whole land. And, and you can see that you know, some, some of them of billionaires have made their money just in a, in a time of crisis when people are looking for bread. <laughs> a man sells off his company, sells off everything. But you see, that was a window, there's an opportunity. And it can pass you by because you don't have money. You know, we're now dealing with practical life here, the faithfulness, okay? The faithfulness. Yeah? Here is somebody, he, 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 he's, he needs a bailout, okay? And he has land which he should have sold maybe for $1 million. But because of his current pressing need, he can easily sell it up at $300,000. And you, child of God, because you have not saved, you don't have that money available, and that opportunity passes you by. You see, it's just basic wisdom. Passes you by. That's what happened here, okay? These guys, the land was, they had lands, they had, but because of sinning, they had not saved for themselves. And so they came to Joseph and told him, what? We have given you all our money. So they had made Joseph very rich, and they made Pharaoh very rich. They gave him all the cattle. Now they said, you know what, you take our bodies and our land because we want food. And he bought the whole land and gave them food. This was a wisdom on a man called Joseph. This wisdom was from God. That means it is relevant to us. And it's just a wisdom called, say, the wisdom of saving. Okay. And such opportunities come. God will always bring such opportunities your way. You know, sometimes not everything that you will get, you will get at its full price. No. <laughs> That's how you end up in the houses you did build. Okay? Yes, sometimes uh, if you wanted to acquire a certain possession, a certain property, it, 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 um, it can be given to you for free. Yes, but you need to provide for that space because the Bible says that when you give, it shall be given back unto you. A good measure pressed down, shaken together, shall, shall men give into your bosom. So you provide for that space. Or God can give you the ability to buy that property. That means you have the full money for that property. Or sometimes he can, circumstances can come and then that property is given to you at a very low cost. But because you have not saved, Opportunity passes you by. What you should have got at one million dollars, you're now getting at three hundred thousand dollars. You see, it's a saving in a way. Yeah, but because it, you 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 save that three hundred thousand dollars, you're able to buy it off, and you, you get it's just that's, that's now like we enter right into the meeting gritties of the idea. That's what happened here, okay? And so in in in, in um in in um in verse twenty the Bible says, and Joseph bought all the land of Egypt for Pharaoh, for the for the Egyptians so it was healed because the famine prevailed over them. So the land became Pharaoh's. Okay? A crisis came and only Joseph had the answer. A crisis came. A crisis came. Yeah. Father, I thank you that you give us such ideas that when a time comes, we are the only ones who have the solution. Okay? And as the people, and, and, as, and as for the people, he removed them, verse 21, as well, he removed them, for, he removed them to the cities from one end of the borders of Egypt, even to the other end thereof. Only the land of the priests bought he not, for the priests had a portion assigned them of Pharaoh, and did eat their portion, which Pharaoh gave them, whereof they sold not their land. Now verse 23, and Jesus said unto the people, Behold, I have bought you this day and your land for Pharaoh. Lo, here is seed for you, and ye shall sow the land. OK? 
okay, verse 24, verse 24. And if, and it shall come to pass in the increase that he shall give the fifth part unto Pharaoh. So he brings back that aspect of the fifth part, verse 30, okay. And four parts shall be your own. For seed, now I wanted to mark that, for seed of the field, for your food, and for them of your households, and for food for your little ones. So the four parts, or the 80%, it says it will be seed for the field, number one. Um, it will be for your food, and for them of your households, and for the food of your little ones. So you have dealt with an aspect called seven. The other aspect now is seed for the field. Seed for the field. Some of you will look at it as investment. Seed for the field. That means you're putting back. Okay? Not everything you receive, you, you just want to consume. No. Part is saved and part is invested. Okay? Now, seed for the field. Now, you can look at it from two angles. Seed for the field can be looked at as giving because giving is a seed. And also the line of investment, seed for the field. And then it speaks of for your food, that's now what you consume. Okay? But of course, for us, we know that there's the aspect of tithe. Okay? You see that? That's, we're dealing with with faithfulness here, faithfulness, faithfulness, faithfulness. There's a sort of tithe. Tithe is not an Old Testament thing. Tithe is eternal. When tithe is, is, is an aspect of the priesthood, when, when Abraham met Melchizedek, after Melchizedek had blessed Abraham, the Bible says Abraham gave him a tenth of everything. It was a revelation in the priesthood. He gave him a tenth of everything. Okay? Tithe, tithe belongs to God. Okay? That's a principle in the scriptures. Tithe, tithe. When we're dealing with faithfulness in finances. Tithe. Okay? That one is not captured in this scripture here. But it's important for us to know that the tithe, and, 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 and I really believe Apostle Mama must have touched on this tithe. When Apostle, Apostle Grace has touched on this tithe, tithe, a tenth of, 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 of whatever comes to you belongs to God. Yes, you can say, oh, all my money belongs to God. <laughs> yes, it is true, but God has asked you for 10%. Mm -hmm. Okay, 10%. Then there's the aspect of fast food. Yeah, fast food is different from tithe. Proverbs chapter 3 verse 9 says, Honor the Lord with thy substance. One of the ways we honor God is with our substance. And with the fast fruits of all your increase. And then next verse says, So shall your bats be, you know, so shall your... Uh, we can look at that scripture. Proverbs, Proverbs, can you just look at it? Uh, I didn't plan to go in there, but Proverbs chapter 3, verse 9. Proverbs 3, verse 9 says, Honor the Lord with thine substance, okay? Yes, you can honor him with our words, you can sing praises, blah, 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 that's wonderful. But there's another way of honoring God, it's with your substance, okay? And with the first fruits of all thine increase, okay? So shall thine bands be filled with plenty. I think that is a promise added to it. So it's an aspect of honor. Honor. We're honoring God with our the first fruits of our increase. I think it's as a girl, chapter 44, verse 30, when it speaks about bringing the first fruit to your priest that he may that he may command the blessing to rest on your house. He may command the blessing to rest. That means uh, the, the, the blessing stays, okay? First fruits is, is a way of, of possessing that level. Hallelujah. So possessing that level. 
you can you can say uh, for example, you can say with my first million dollars I'll give you to God. My 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 first hundred thousand dollars I'll give you to God. You know, or, or you can say uh, uh, um, every first my increase of every year, the first increase in that year maybe in January I give you to God. Okay, there, there are many ways of doing it. Okay, but the, at the point is, first foot goes upward, goes to God. And who is the representation of God in your life? It's your priest. Your man of God. Give it to him, but you bring the first foot to your to the priest. <laughs> Some people say, I'm my own priest, the priest in the house. <laughs> yes, it is true. But there's such a thing as a high priest. Jesus Christ is a high priest, and then we are priests. But even us as priests, we have those we whom God has ordained as our priests. You see that? So you take your first fruit to your priest. You take your tithe to your priest. Hallelujah. Okay. So there, there are those aspects which are not captured in, in the scripture we're looking at in uh, in um in um in in Genesis chapter forty seven. Okay. First fruit and then tithe. Okay. Those those ones are like number one and two. Now number three is the saving. I've spoken about the saving. Okay, and 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 I, 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 the reason why the reason why I read all that was for you to see that the mind on saving is bigger than just personal sustenance. That's what Joseph thought. Joseph thought that when we save, you know, we'll be able to save the land of Egypt. But actually, in the mind of God, you are saving the whole world because the man saved. Because the man self, because of your saving, you can what can you use your saving to do something so big? Saying then, Hallelujah. Okay, so saving is number three. Okay, the first one is 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 of course first fruit. The second one is tithe. Okay, the third one is saving. The fourth one is seed for the field. Seed for the field. Okay, we read that in verse twenty-four. He says the fifth part and two pharaoh. Of course, this now this time that they become servants of Pharaoh. So that's why he said the fifth part goes to Pharaoh. But but the principle earlier was we put aside the fifth part. Okay? When he says and the four parts shall be for it will be your own. And he says, for seed of the field, seed of the field, very important, and then for your food. So we have First fruit, we have tithes, we have savings, then we have seed for the field. And I, and, I, and, I, and I say that seed for the field can be looked at in two ways. Giving, okay, and investment. Giving and investment. Giving and investment. Why, why do I say giving? Because in, in Corinthians, it, it speaks about how God loves a cheerful giver. And then in the next verse it speaks about God multiplying your seeds of righteousness, your fruit of righteousness. And then it speaks of him giving seed to the soul and bread to the eater. Okay. Seed to the soul and bread to the eater. So he, he links this aspect of seed to giving. He says it's more blessed to give than to receive. So that is seed for the field. Giving. Give to the poor. We give as we are led. But you see. And then the aspect of investment, okay? I, I won't touch those two. And then the other aspect is personal consumption, okay? Your, your, the, for your food and for, for for them of your household, that means uh, people that are depending on you, you get it? For the food of the little ones. And then in verse 25, it says, and they say, thou hast saved our lives. That means these guys were impressed, they were happy that that's. But remember, <laughs> They had bought them and their land, but still they were, they were happy. Said, you have saved our lives. Let us find grace in the sight of my Lord, and we will be their servants. They were happy. Why? Because the man saved. Because of his saving, he was, people followed him. You see that? That's how the Bible says that, 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 that uh, the, 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 the borrower is a servant to the lender. You see that? The borrower. It doesn't matter whether the borrower is born again or not. 
It doesn't matter whether the lender is born again or not. The principal stands the borrower as a servant to the lender. You see that? Yeah? So, saving is very important for us to always sell, put aside money. There, all that comes in is not for consumption, no. There is an aspect of tithe. Uh, you can, you can do your fast food, so they can do them every year or whichever, has, you know. Um, it's, another, it's another topic of its own, okay. Um, then there's the aspect of saving. The list you can do is a fifth, 20%. Tithe, the Bible says it's 10%. Okay, so 10%, 20%, that is 70%. And then, so, I mean 30%, so you know, it's 70%. Now, that 70%, part of it is seed for the field, and the other part is consumption. You see that? That's a man being faithful with an unrighteous mother. Not everything that comes is just for consumption, and you know, now because I have. I have 100,000 today, I'm going to buy this, I'm going to buy. No, there has to be a level of, 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 of faithfulness and accountability to God. Okay? So this thing, the seed of the field, as I said, look at it from two angles, the giving aspect and investment. Aspect of giving and investment. Now, we don't have a lot of, we don't have time. <laughs> I see my time is really, really, really short. Um, maybe I'll just touch on investment. You know, when the Bible talks about investment, this is something that I learned from uh, from my father, Apostle Grace. Okay, he mentioned it uh, one day in passing, and and I picked it. Okay, it's in Matthew chapter twenty-five. You can look at Matthew twenty-five. Matthew chapter 25, verse 14. Matthew 25, verse 14. Um, now, the Bible speaks of a certain man was going on a trip and he called his servants and gave them and delegated to them responsibilities, okay? I'm reading from the message version. Verse 15 says, to one he gave $5,000, this is message, to another, to another $2,000, and the third one gave him $1,000, depending on their abilities. Okay, so it's, this one depending on their abilities, then he left. Verse 16 says, right off, the first servant went to work and doubled his master's investment. So it was an investment, you see. The second did the same. But the man with a single, 1,000 dug a hole and carefully buried his master's money. After a long absence, the master of these three servants came back and settled up with them. The one gave, the one given $5,000 showed him how he had doubled his investment. He had doubled his investment. His master commend, commended him. He says, good work. You did your job well. From now on, be my partner. You see that? The servant with, so I think in the kingdom says, well done, good and faithful servant. So he was called the faithful servant. Why? Because he invested. Yeah. Then, um, the same thing happened to one of $2,000. The one of $1,000, look at verse 24. The servant gave one, the servant given 1,000, given 1,000 said, Master, I know you have high standards and head careless ways that you demand the best and make no allowances for error. I was afraid and disappointed, so I found a good hiding place and secured your money. Here it is, safe and sound, down to the last cent. The master was furious. That is a terrible way to live. It's criminal to live cautiously like that. If you knew I was after the best, why did you do less than the least? Verse 27, the least you could have done would have been to invest the sum of money with the bankers, where at least I would have gotten a little interest. So Apostle Grace was, was showing us that actually the least investment you can do is invest the money in a bank. <laughs> and at least you get a little interest. That's the least investment. It's scripture. It's right here. And it says, take the thousand and give it to the one who risks the most. 
and get rid of this play itself who won't go out on a limb. Hallelujah. So it's, it's wisdom to invest. Wisdom to invest. Now, where to invest also matters. Where to give, remember we're dealing with the seed of the field. Where to give, where to invest matters. It's dependent on the leading of the Holy Spirit. Okay? Remember, the Bible speaks of, of, of Isaac, and the Bible says that uh, uh, he was in the land of Gerah, and a famine came in that land, and he was planning to leave, and God told him, no, stay in this land. I will bless you in this land. And the Bible says he planted in that same land, and that same year he received a hundredfold. The very place where others had tried to plant and failed because of the famine, when he planted, he got a hundredfold. What was the difference? The voice of God, the instruction of the Spirit of God. That means you can even, both of you can make the same investment, but one fails and, and the other succeeds. Why? Because one was led by the Spirit and the other was not. You see that? And, and, and the ground, the field, it was a famine. So logically, it was logical for people to leave because the famine had come. That means sometimes the Spirit of God can lead you to invest in things that do not logically make sense. Right now, it doesn't make sense to invest in this right now. But as long as you're sure, as Anu told you, go ahead. Because it is his voice, it is his leading that brings the multiplication. Hallelujah. It's his leading. When he tells you to do this, that's how you... You see, that's why I say it's a spiritual thing. So as you grow in the things of as you grow in the spirit, you, you know, you learn to hear him even on your finances. He, he instructs you, he can tell you do this. As you invest, you see investment here is not just investing in, 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 in things, but also investing in yourself, in knowledge, investing in knowledge, in wisdom, in understanding, in your field of, 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 of engagement. You can invest time in there to learn more. And as you build your value, so does the, the aspect of finances be built. You see that? So this whole thing is, is, is just intertwined, okay? It's intertwined. Now, so we have dealt partially in the aspect of investment, okay? Uh, and I've showed you in scripture the least investment is putting your money in the bank. <laughs> so actually, I think another version says you should have invested in security, the bonds, things like that, fixed deposits. No, you, you know the things better than me. Okay? I'm sure some of you are better acquainted in this area. But that's the least kind of investment. There are other forms of investment. But now, those other forms that I say, you need the leading of the Holy Spirit. He tells you, just like it was spoken to Isaac. He told him, don't leave this land. You stay here, I will bless you here. And when he planted in that very land, he received a good form. Hallelujah. But let us look at the aspect of giving, okay? Remember, giving and investment are part of the seed for the field. A seed for the field, but the aspect of giving. We want to look at Second Corinthians chapter eight. Second Corinthians chapter eight. Um, verse one. Second Corinthians chapter eight, verse one. Now the Bible says. Um, Verse 1 in King James, Moreover, brethren, we do you to wit of the grace of God bestowed on the churches of Macedonia, how that in great, how that in a great trial of affliction the abundance of their joy and their deep poverty abounded unto the riches of their liberality. Okay? For to, for to their power I bear record, yea, and beyond their power they were willing of themselves, praying us with much entity that we would receive the gift and take upon us the fellowship of the minister and do the same in not as we hoped, but first gave themselves to the Lord and unto us by the will of God, in so much that we desired Titus that as he had begged, as he had begun, sorry, so he would also finish in you 
the same grace also. Okay? Therefore, as ye abound in everything in faith, in utterance, in knowledge, in all diligence, in your love to us, see that ye abound in this grace also. I want you to notice that. You need to understand that uh, Jesus came full of grace and truth. And the Bible says, of his fullness have we received grace hit upon grace. Now, that can be looked at in two ways. That the fullness of grace has been given to the church. Remember, the church is his body. Okay? And individuals can have certain graces which other individuals may not have. But it doesn't mean they have, don't have access to it. That's one way of looking at it, that grace, the fullness of this grace has been given to the church as a whole. Or you can say each individual has the fullness. It's activated um, differently. You can look at it from both angles, okay? So now here he speaks that, remember he's talking about the Corinthian church, the Corinthian church. The, the grace on them was, the, they had the grace on them, they were abounding, they were overflowing in the grace of faith. And faith was a grace, because faith is a grace. In utterance, that means they had a certain grace in utterance. They could act a certain way, okay? Uh, in knowledge, in diligence, I'm looking at verse 7, okay? In your love to us, then says, see that ye abound in this grace also. It's just a certain grace. They see that you are bound in this grace also. So these others are also graces which are working. Okay? They say, see that you are bound in this grace also. I mean, this grace, remember I was talking about the Macedonian church. You say, remember how he started in, 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 in verse 1. He says, moreover, brethren, we'll do you to wit of the grace of God bestowed on the church of Macedonia. That means the grace on the churches of Macedonia was the grace of giving. That's a certain grace. Okay? So it's a piece of giving. Giving is a grace. Faith, you know. When you, when you read, I don't have time to talk about that, but when you go to the very first Corinthians chapter 1, you, you, you see how he speaks of the church in Corinth. And this is where, you know, they came short in no gift. Okay? And all those are graces. A, church, a certain church can have a certain grace. And that which is different from another church. Okay. Now here yeah, talking about Macedonia, it says that these guys there's a grace on them of giving. Now he's he's admonishing, he's telling the, the Corinthian church that sit in that also see that 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 you go beyond measure in this case. Remember, even if even uh, even uh, uh, Peter speaks of us growing in grace. That means a man can grow in the grace of giving. You see that? But now, I want to understand the kind of grace <laughs> that was in this church. Okay, in verse 1. It says, now, I want to report on the surprising and generous ways in which God is working in the churches in Macedonia. Macedonia and the grace of God is what fears the people of those churches, pushing them to the very limit. That means things were hitting them left, left, right, center. The trial exposed their true colors. They were incredibly happy, though desperately poor. The pressure triggered something totally unexpected. An outpouring of pure and generous gifts, these are physical gifts, not gifts of the spirit, physical gifts, okay? Then verse 3 says, I was there and I saw it for myself. This is Paul saying, I saw it for myself. They gave offerings of whatever they could, far more than they could afford. That means when they, this grace is working with a man, he goes beyond. Look at what verse 4 says, pleading for the privilege of helping out. They were pleading. They were insisting, saying, please take our gift. That is a, that is a man. <laughs> this is this one we'll just give you, you know. This is the grace of gift. Where you even plead, please take my gift. 
Please, please take it, please take it. That's grace. That's the grace. Verse 5. I mean, see how, how it happened in verse 5. This was totally spontaneous. Okay? Entirely their own idea and we've had nothing to do And caught us completely off guard. Now, but you can notice this. He says, what explains it was that they had first given themselves unreservedly to God and to us. The other giving simply flowed out of the purpose of God working in their lives. That is it. That is how a man abounds in the grace of giving. You give, it's, it's about giving yourself unreservedly to God. Now there are levels in there. Okay. They give themselves unreserved because it says this explains this is what explains it. He's explaining how it happened. What explains it was they first gave themselves unreservedly to God and to us. That was the reason why they were abounding in the grace of giving. Hallelujah. Let us look at still chapter nine. Still chapter nine. Uh uh we're going to read from verse six. Chapter 9, verse 6. Okay? Chapter 9, verse 6. He says, Remember this. He who sows sparingly and grudgingly will also live sparingly and grudgingly. And he who sows generously, that blessings may come to someone, will also live generously and with blessings. Let each one give as he has made up his own mind and purposed in his heart. That is very important. You have made up your mind and purposed in your heart. Not reluctantly, or sorrowfully, or under compulsion. That's what a man of God says that Fanero, we are spirit led givers. Okay, we don't, you, you're not coerced to give. No, you're spirit led as you have made up in your heart and in your mind, not under, not reluctantly, or sorrowfully, or under compulsion. Now, I want you to understand the relationship God has with such a kind of giver. Okay, I'm reading from the Amplified Version, in verse 7. He says, for God loves, you see, when we read in KJV, he says, for God loves a cheerful giver. You may miss out the, the depth of it, you know, okay, yeah, yeah, God loves all of us, you know, yeah, God loves all of us. Yes, it's true, God loves all of us, but it's a special kind <laughs> of love God has for a cheerful giver. How did you notice that? He says, he takes pleasure in, he takes pleasure in, he prizes above other things. <laughs> he prizes above other things. And the Bible says he's unwilling to abandon or to do without. That is so powerful. He's unwilling to abandon or to do without. That means God cannot do without the keeper. Oh my God. He's unwilling to abandon or to do. That means a man, because of his giving, can God can't abandon him? Yes, I know he can't abandon us. Well, I'll never leave him for a second. But there's a special kind. Eh? You, you know, the, the Bible speaks of, of, of uh, I think it was Cornelius. He, his, the giving of his arms went to God as a special, as an offering. So it was a, he, he had to send somebody, you know, this one here, I, he has to get born again. He wasn't born again, but because of his giving, God had to give an instruction. But you see, it was more than just, I want you to understand the weight of this. It was more than just him getting born again. No, it was Peter opening up the door of the Gentile world. You see that? Peter opened the door to the Gentile world by preaching to Cornelius. The door that Paul entered into. <laughs> and that was because a man was giving. I want you to understand the weight of this. This is this is beyond just God sending a man to a house for them to get saved, which is very powerful, which is very important, because God is interested in each and every single soul. But it was bigger than that. He literally opened the door of the gospel to the Gentile world. But it all started through a man giving. Hallelujah. The Bible says he's unwilling to abandon or to do without. 
a cheerful now he explains what cheerful giver is he says a joyous giver a prompt to do it giver whose heart is in their giving whose heart is in their giving so a man of god says that, that now you become more conscious of your giving than of your of your receiving what you become more conscious of what you give than what you receive this is this is the place your heart is in your giving See, my, 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 uh, my brothers my sisters this is this is this is this is a grace like no other the grace of giving and i don't need to understand what uh, is sometimes we don't really get the gist of it let's look at the next verse verse 8 because of this verse 8 and god is able to make all grace <laughs> god is make, able to make all grace all these other graces you can they can come to you because of giving <laughs> because of giving you see that because of giving, you're honoring something a man of God says whatever you honor you attract you honor by sowing a seed okay this is just this is wisdom I'm, I'm not saying um, uh, anything outside scripture no we're reading it together from the scriptures it's right there God is able to make all grace. Okay, remember things we are reading in, in, in 2 Corinthians chapter 8. The guys were abounding in the grace of utterance, uh, the grace of faith, in all these things working in their lives. And a man through his giving can attract that grace. God is able to make all grace come to you in abundance so that you may always and under all circumstances, look at what the scripture is saying, that you may always and under all circumstances, and whatever the need, be self-sufficient, posing, possessing enough to require no aid or support, and furnished in abundance for every good work. That means you're furnished for every good work. Remember, he's unwilling to do without a cheerful giver. So you're furnished for every good work. Whatever God is doing, you're part of it. You're part of it. You're part of it through your giving. Hallelujah. But remember, we are spirit-led givers. We are spirit -led. As the Spirit of God leads you, as the Spirit of God leads you, as the Spirit of God leads you, you know, he says the prompt do it giver. He leads us through those prompting. It's a that prompting in your heart. You do it. Your heart is in your giving. Let me tell you, that happens when a man has given himself unreservedly to God. That's how we excel in that grace. That's how we grow in that grace. Okay? And the next verse says, um, and you know, and God who provides seed, verse 10, God provides seed for the sower and bread for the eater, will also provide a multiply. Remember? Remember Apostle Grace was talking, was talking on, I think on Thursday, that the seed of the New Testament is not for addition. It's not for you know, the survival seed. Okay? It's a seed of multiplication. That means we are looking to responsibility. Our seed is not just for addition. What I'm putting this so that I can survive, you know. Uh, God is not a betting place. When I give him one dollar, he'll bring back one dollar. When I give him two dollars, he'll bring back two dollars. No. What you are attracting is actually grace. Graces. When you give, you are attracting graces. But you need to have the right mind in giving that this is attracting a grace, okay, a grace, a certain grace on your life. You're multiplying in graces, you're increasing in the graces of God. He's able to make all grace come to you. That's what the verse says, okay? So, giving is very important. You can't, I remember we said it's a grace. You can't be forced into it. You cannot be coerced into it. No, your heart has to be in your giving. Okay. And, and we grow in that grace. We are not all at the same level of giving, okay? But we grow in that grace. But you, you need to desire to grow in that grace. Because remember, you are talking to the Corinthians church, you're saying, see to it that you are bound in this grace also. You are saying, you are bound also in this thing here. Yes, I, I know you, you, you're okay in faith, I know you're okay in utterance, you know, all those things are okay, but see to it that you are bound in this grace also. It's important. It's important for you to abound this grace. And he explains to us why that God is unwilling to do without a cheerful giver. Hallelujah. 
Hallelujah. So the giving here covers the offering, it covers uh, giving to the poor, it covers uh, the things that you do for people, for the household of faith. Remember, remember it says a man sows what he reaps, and then he says he that, he that sows to the spirit shall of the spirit reap eternal life, he that sows to the flesh shall of the flesh reap uh, corruption. That's why I said your spirit led. What makes you sow to the spirit? Is because the Spirit of God told you, your Spirit led. Otherwise, you, you, you can sow, but your sowing is to the flesh, and the Bible says of the flesh you reap corruption. Hallelujah. You can also invest, but your investment is flesh, and of the flesh you reap corruption. So those are guys who invest, but nothing comes through. The guys who keep, but nothing comes through, because it's of the flesh. Okay? There's too, there's too much carnality attached to what they are doing. Their heart is not in their giving, they are giving out of sorrow, compulsion. That is all flesh. That is all a manifestation of the flesh. Giving out of compulsion, you know, giving emotionally. No, 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 no. We're not that kind who do those things. We are spirit led givers. We are spirit led givers. Our heart is in our giving. We are prompt to do it. What the Spirit of God brings you to release. I'm telling you, this scripture is so big. I wish you could take time to meditate on this thing. And God is able to make all grace. All grace. All grace. This is one of the ways of, in, of growing in grace. It will give it. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Now, I think I need to stop right there because my, there's too much to share in there. Um, but I think that has been very helpful. Now, please don't forget the faithfulness, okay? We're dealing with tithes. We're dealing with fast fruit. We're dealing with savings, we're dealing with the seed for the field. And here we're talking about the giving aspect and the investment aspect, which I've tried to explain a bit. And then also the, the aspect of consumption, what is left for you to consume, because you, know, you need to consume you, your family, and, and, and people around you. So that's not the, the aspect of being faithful, of being faithful in money, faithful to the wisdom of God as far as the finances are concerned. And then also, I spoke about the first part of you understanding who you are, you are Lord over, you know. God, Jesus is your master, not money. And his mastery in your life has also made you a master over money and other things. And you have to exercise your consciousness, that faith in you that nothing you, you only move because God says, not because you don't have money or you have money. I don't know. Money doesn't tell you to do something, neither does it tell you not to do something. It is the Spirit of God. Hallelujah. Praise God. So I want us to pray. Father, we thank you for what you have revealed to us. I thank you that you take us even deeper, you show us even deeper mysteries. You establish us more in this understanding. In Jesus' name I've prayed. Amen.